you. Great to see everyone again. Uh, and we've been hearing a lot about LPG, and here they are. So I'm going to turn it over uh, to Oystein Wagen, Equity Research Analyst for Fernley Securities, who will uh, lead the discussion. Thank you, Oystein. Hello. Thank you. Uh, here we go. So today we have a great panel on, on, on LPG shipping right here. We're uh, joined by Ted Young, CFO of Dorian, uh, Oivin Lindemann, uh, CCO of Navigator Gas, and Oystein Kalleklev, the executive chairman of Avance Gas. So uh, let's hope it doesn't get too confusing with three very similar names uh, up here, but uh, we'll try our best. But um, I think we can jump uh, straight in uh, and talk a bit about um, a high level. So if we start on the VLGC side, uh, maybe with Ted, um, despite the drawback, call it in the recent weeks, you know, from the early innings of the UK Ukraine conflict, uh, race jumped from uh, sub 20k per day to up to 50 over 50k per day. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, so, so can you just talk a bit about the dynamics and, and yeah. why that happened? Absolutely. Um, so, as <coughs> uh, Oisin said, we, uh, as a sector, saw rates kind of come off as uh, there's a lot of uncertainty after the Ukraine uh, invasion by the uh, by the Russians. Um, I think just to put it in context, the, uh, the, the Russia exports about six million metric tons a year of LPG, um, which you know it's a it's an over 300 million uh, metric ton market worldwide. About half of it goes by rail car, either into Central Europe or into uh, the stands, and uh, the rest of it goes by uh, by ship out of uh, Usluga, which uh, my colleague Ivan's uh, far more uh, fast along to tell you about, but. So as a, as a macro question uh, for the global LPG trade, it didn't matter much. So we all kind of thought the pullback was a bit overdone. So as rates, uh, as we expected, kind of rallied uh, from uh, you know, the, the 20s or maybe even a bit less, we peaked up in the 70s. Uh, and then we've, we, we, we came back down into the 30s and uh, our low 30s. And now we're kind of back in the mid 30s. An interesting development has been, you know, we always talk about uh, the, the, the rates and the context of uh, Arabian Gulf to Chiba or U.S. Gulf to Chiba, and they're both about the same right now. Oftentimes there's a difference, uh, often in favor of the West, but right now the shining star of all the routes is actually uh, U.S. Gulf to Flushing, which is making, you know, $50,000 a day versus, say, thirty-five on the other two. Why is that? Well, part of it is the need for LPG uh, in North in North uh, Northwestern Europe, um, but also a big part of the LPG trade, as we'll talk about later, is the petrochemical trade. And so, um, you know, the LPG naphtharb is really important and uh, it's starting to turn back in favor. So that tends to be a big driver of rates. And you know, as we look forward over the next few months, we uh, are you know cautiously optimistic about how that might affect trade. Thank you. And uh, Einstein, do you want to add anything before we move on to navigators? Oh, <coughs> I, I think uh, Ted is, uh, is right. I just I talked to him before the panel and I said, you know, these days, if you have a scrubber, you don't have to talk about cash break even. So if somebody tell you, what's your cash break, in, break even, you can say, I, I have a scrubber on board. And then uh, it basically makes up for the cash break even because the scrubber spreads are insane. Uh, and also, actually, you are making money on, uh, we have these new two new buildings now where you're burning LPG. Actually, that is in also in the money. And we have four more of those uh, dual fuel LPGs where you can burn the LPG as a fuel. So, uh, you know, if, if you can avoid b burning very low sulfur oil these days, it's uh, a big competitive advantage. Uh, we have six ships on, you know, uh, 13 ships on the water right now, uh, four new buildings, uh, three, the three oldest ones, which are the thirsty ones we have on TC, so we really don't have any fuel exposure on those, but uh, we have eight ships in the spot market, six of them with scrubber, and that really makes a lot of money these days, and then we have two on index, the new, new buildings. So uh, market's been soft, you know, if, if you ask me, uh, uh, four weeks ago, the market was b red hot, and we were at this $70,000 levels uh, that Ted said. Went down to yeah, maybe almost like low 30s, and, uh, but it's been picking up now. And uh, Houston Shiba is, you know, you can probably do at 105 now, and AG, 
Uh, yeah, close to 90, so it's 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 picking up from the. But th this this market is incredibly volatile. You know, I'm I'm from the LNG business, and <laughs> you know, I thought uh, <laughs> LNG was volatile, but this business is crazy. But you know, volatility is good. You can make a lot of money on volatility as long as you have money to to kind of fund your business. Then uh, you know, actually, volatility is good, and uh, you know, I I don't mind. And uh, Eivind, uh so on on the navigator segment how how's this the development yeah i mean uh, <coughs> as ted mentioned lpg from russia waterborne is quite tiny however there are exports out of the baltic that you need ice class ships that uh, navigator has done in the past um, but uh, with all things uh, lpg is very versatile so one door closes another opens so instead of uh, exporting lpg from Ustuga in russia to europe that shut down, and uh, we have uh, friends in Finland who relied on rail supply from Russia with the NAFTA, LPG, and so forth. The border is closed, and what happens? Hey, do you have an ice class ship? Because uh, your friends in the east don't uh, have it anymore. Can we have it, Finland? And we said yes. So, so it's very dynamic, and. Uh, we didn't see that one coming, and it's here. And uh, we fixed uh, fixed some ships to, to Finland in preparation for winter. So they, why are they doing it? Because they are looking ahead, and they need the reliable supply of their feedstock to run their plants. And that's what the LPG is used for there. And that's very important. You know, the Europeans are looking for reliability, so they have to change sourcing. So, uh, so that's quite an important sort of swing factor that has happened. Thank you. And if we kind of talk a bit about the, the current uh, commodity pricing backdrop, it's, it's quite a good one for LPG shipping, uh, obviously. However, uh, and then looking at US production growth, etc., which will be f very important, um, it kind of seems um, that uh, capital discipline is still on the agenda for some of these guys. You saw, for example, Diamondback in Chesapeake earlier this week announcing quite large buyback programs. So what are you guys kind of seeing, hearing, or thinking around uh, production growth in, in terms of timing right now? Um, I think, you know, we're seeing, you know, year over year U.S. production growth of around 6%. Um, I think that jives with the EIA's forecast for the year. You know, the EIA tends to be a bit conservative, so hopefully there's a bit of upside from those numbers. Um, that said, you know, you're absolutely right. The pressures that um, upstream guys are getting from their investors um, for capital discipline is is uh, is obviously played a role. On the other hand, from our perspective, you know, at $120 a barrel, you can probably do both. Um, but again, uh, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of history there, so they're, they're they're sensitive. And look, I think it's been a challenge for guys in that sector to make investment decisions because um, you know Washington's been very clear from the outset about its desire for an energy transition. But you know nobody saw Ukraine coming, and so now. It's kind of hard to justify to investors, um, you know, all of a sudden investing in production when there could be taxes and regulation looming. So I think those guys are, you know, a little bit betwixt and between. But that said, um, you know, 6% year over year growth is pretty good. And so we, you know, uh, you know, there could be some upside. But, you know, right now it's, it's all kind of working for our sector. Uh, the, the issue is uh, one is, of course, upstream production, but the other one is midstream. Is the infrastructure midstream there to take it off? So the fractionators, uh, export terminals are there, but they have to be fractionated, go to the fractionator to split uh, the different natural gas liquids. So uh, that's a question mark. But of course, if you know uh, American midstream uh, industry, if there's money to be made, they're going to do it. But of course, there's squeeze on uh, on lead times, on production, on, on on construction, new infrastructure, and so forth. So, so that that is a question mark that uh, I don't have the answer to, but uh, it's uh, it could be a bottleneck. You know, I, I hope we get this kind of investor into shipping. You know, these shale players are making a fortune, and they are not investing because the investors has have capital discipline and pay back the money, you know, these are the investors we need in shipping. Then we can finally make some money here. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, Öystein, so probably if you can also talk about the importance of the U.S. in terms of ton mile effects for LPG shipping as well. Yeah, of course, but U.S. is always positive. 
you know, even if the cargo goes to Europe, it's longer than the normal distance. So US will always be positive. So it's more a question mark, how positive is it? Are it going to, uh, to Asia or going to Europe? It's will positive. But if it, of course, if it goes to, <laughs> to Asia, and we've seen the Panama congestion this year, I think it was up to 18 days. So, uh, you know, if, if we have cargoes flowing to Asia, you know, uh, of course, China has been a bit subdued on imports because of the COVID. But uh, if you're going there, you know, you're, you're not only talking about ton mile, you're also talking about ton time because of the waiting. So certainly uh, people are making money down in, in uh, Texas and Louisiana drilling these uh, wells. The duck inventory is dried up. So there need to be made some new investments. and. You, you make, uh, you know, the payback times on these fields and the time to, mon time to money is very short. So I think there will be investments. And, you know, if the private public markets are not providing this money, the private market will. Because certainly there's not a lot of good places to find a lot of these kind of returns in this market. And, and call it the increase from the Middle East. Would you say that that's all incremental or would it take away some of the longer haul trade? Uh, of course, uh, this is more to oil politics, so this is driven by Russia, and so of course, AG will probably push up uh, oil production, and then you will get some more extra LPG. So it's uh, yeah, mostly incremental growth because this Russian sea, s you know, the Russian seaborne LPG trade is tiny. It's like one and a half million tons out of close to 110 million tons. So. Uh, 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 a lot of people are talking about it, for, but you know, in terms of cargoes for VLGC, it's zero. There's no VLGC cargo with uh, Russian LPG. So uh, if the OPEC is our uh, increasing production, that is giving VLGC cargoes, which are replacing zero Russian VLGC cargoes. Yeah, and I'd, I think I'd add to that. Um, <coughs> it I agree with. Uh, 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 <laughs> sorry, that it's incremental as well. Because if you look all the way up, you know, through the value chain, um, we continue to see really good pull through demand for LPG as a product. As I then rightly said, it's a very uh, versatile product. So again, um, it continues to take market share as a product away from biomass and other less environmentally friendly gases. And it's got the benefit of having a much cheaper uh, shoreside infrastructure than, say, LNG. Uh, it can be loaded into a canister, brought out into rural areas. And so, you know, we continue to see it's a sector that's historically grown with at least GDP, and seaborne trade's usually grown at a multiple because most of the growth is in Asia, far away from the uh, sources of production. So, um, and it's sort of an old saying in, in LPG that um, sort of makes sense, uh, which is. Um, you know, it's a supply-driven product, and essentially, it always finds a home at a price. So it's usually not in the 55% that's at the uh, the base demand because that's sort of required year in and year out. But the petrochemical market, auto gas, some of these other markets end up being the the final price taker and moving that last incremental ton. Good, and, and maybe switching gears a bit and, and, and talking a bit more on on the demand side of the equation uh, before we touch upon the the order book, which a lot of people are a bit worried about. Um, so, so if we were to roughly split demand into two, residential and, and petrochemical, uh, which one do you think will be the, the major driver going forward, Eivind? Uh, I think uh, in Europe, uh, the demand for petrochemicals from the US have uh, come and gone. Uh, but since uh, what happened 24th of February, I think that's going to be a steady, steady demand that we haven't seen before. So the, U uh, the issue with the Europeans, of course, who are going to supply it? So they, of course, are looking to Uncle Sam, and Uncle Sam is there to help at a price. But the Europeans have an issue with the infrastructure, so they haven't built the infrastructure to import. So there's a huge bottleneck in Europe to get the products, all products, energy, LPG, petrochemicals, and ammonia to, to the consumers. And that is a big issue. So they're fast-tracking uh, fast some of these things today. But in terms of petrochemical demand, Yes, you can see Ted mentioned just briefly the, the complexities of deciding should I run my cracker on nafta oil or should I switch to LPG or should I have any other uh, feedstocks. Ethane is by far the cheapest if you want to produce ethylene and that has a strong future. However, is your production, can it take ethane or not? Is it a gas cracker or not? So, um, so the, for us, for Navigator, we don't do so much LPG to Europe for uh, energy 
but we do a lot of petrochemicals and, and that's kind of our thing. But Europe will stay strong in demand for, for all products from the US. And that ties in nicely with our own terminal, ethylene terminal in Houston. And uh, Ted, uh, so are you at all worried that uh, there won't be a, enough demand to absorb uh, export growth? Uh, for example, if you look at PDH capacity going forward, et cetera. Yeah, I mean, um, I'm not worried about the, the longer term growth. I mean, it, uh, you know, the, the UN's identified LPG as a bridge fuel, so LPG is part of the solution to decarbonization. It's not part of the problem. And, you know, to your point about PDH plants, um, you know, initially when, when uh, we both went public in 2014, there was a whole lot of discussion about that, and I think there was a degree of healthy skepticism. It's like, okay, the, the, you know, all these plants are going to come online in China. Um, well, they all came online. They all came online on time, and all the investors in those plants seem to make pretty good money. Capacity utilization rates have been uh, pretty strong, obviously tailed off during COVID some, but running at pretty good rates. And so if you look at what's on the books, I think we anticipate that there'll be a demand for 25 million metric tons of LPG by uh, 2025, assuming all these projects come online, which again, historically they have. And that corresponds to like, you know, 100 VLGCs. So that gives us some cold comfort that the outlook is reasonably decent. And, and uh, maybe we can touch a bit more on, on the order book uh, this time. So uh, a lot of people, uh, or, or is this, to put it that way, is it a tradi traditional example of shipping, what's happening after a solid peri period of earnings that you go out and order? Or, or how, do you, uh, how are you looking at 2023? Uh, are you? Uh, uh, it's like de déjà vu uh, 2020. You know, everybody talked about Scrubber in 2020 on the LNG. But then LNG, everybody talked about the order book for 2021. And Everybody was, was so bearish because the uh, order book on LNG side at that time was 54 ships. And then 2021 came and it was the best LNG spot market in a decade. Uh, and it's a bit similar now being in LPG because uh, everybody's talking about this order book. Uh, how many ships are going to uh, hit the water in, in 2023? Yeah, it's certainly a lot, but also the order book in 2024 is very slim, uh, 25 is zero. New building prices today, if you go to the Korean yards for a good spec VLGC, you are getting close to $95 million. So it's kind of a bit <laughs> difficult to order on speculation on these kind of prices, especially given the fact that the whole sector is being priced on NAV at I don't know, I, I saw this presentation from Jürgen in DNB yesterday. I think he had price an NAV of 0 0.7 for the sector. So then if you have C price NAV 0 0.7, you have the highest VLGC prices ever from the yard. Slots are getting tied. Yeah, of course, there will be a lot of ships next year. But you also next year, you also have to think about 24 when there are like five ships for delivery. And then zero for 2025. And if if you want to have a ship in 2025, you have to get 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 moving because those slots are being gobbled up by all these uh, <laughs> LNG carriers and uh, and all these uh, container ships. So, so um, you know, I, I'm not too much worried about it. Um, yeah, m might be softer this next year than than 2022, but uh, I'm pretty bullish about 24 and and five. You know, which you know, and then also it's the new ships. They are so much more efficient. I think people tend to forget this because, of course, in LNG we know this with the steam and tri fuel and uh, and the mega XDFs. But these dual fuel ships, you know, they are kicking ass when it comes to fuel efficiency. And then if you can also burn LPG, which is much cheaper these days than uh, very low sulfur, you know, uh, you know. When you are breaking even, other people are losing the shirt. So, you know, uh, I, I, I'm, I, I think also you see the, the scrap prices and the second-hand prices are pretty firm. You know, if you have a 15-year VLGC today, you can get $50 million. So, <laughs> so yeah. yeah. And, and uh, it's a good segue into uh, l looking beyond 2023, 2024, 2025, etc. It it's hard to look that far, obviously. Uh, but, you know, y you have s a lot of the same effects as you saw when you, the market rallied the, the last time. Uh, and you had rates averaging, I don't know, it was $80,000, $90,000 per day. Um, 
uh, are you expecting much of the same development this time around? Uh, I, <laughs> I don't want to say yes, otherwise there'll be a spate of new building orders and we'll ruin all the fun. Um, Look, I think there's a, there are a number of differences between 2014-15 uh, and, and today. Um, you know, the, or the fleet was 130 vessels. Um, globally, it's over 300 today. Um, the U.S. in 2014 exported, I want to say, 9 million metric tons. And, you know, this year we'll do 50. So the contours of the market have changed a lot. Um, so, you know, do we have the potential for uh, a good run? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, I think... Uh, I see your your estimates for sixty thousand for for twenty twenty four from your lips to God's ears that would be fantastic, um, but um, you know I think the, I think the fundamentals set up for a good run um, and and I want to echo what uh, uh, Oisin said as well that the new ships are really much more fuel efficient um, you know the, the the I think if you never burn a metric ton of LPG on these on these new builds you're still I think five metric, three to five metric tons a day, uh, better off than you would be with the existing. I hope uh, it's more than five. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I also think it's important to to highlight, you know, on, on the side, that the, the order book situation is quite different. Yes, but it's uh, also a smaller segment. It's about 120 boats, uh, so the order book uh, is uh, smaller. That's correct. But uh, looking forward, <coughs> uh, petrochemicals will have a good run uh, from the U.S. to Europe and Asia. Uh, so we're working on various infrastructure to, to unlock uh, supply so it can hit the water and help the segment. So that's pretty good. Ammonia is a big story. So, uh, you know, one of the effects from, uh, from the war is uh, no ammonia from Ukraine, which is 20% of low for seaborne train. So that's uh, gone. So ammonia, but ammonia will have to go further, so increase ton mile. So if you go to Home Depot and you buy your bag of fertilizer, it's the reason why it's so expensive, because ammonia being a feedstock to fertilizer production is gone. Um, but uh, there's a big big push for, for green, blue ammonia. I think ammonia for, for our segment has a good uh, positive future. And if these guys do well, generally the smaller guys like Navigator, we will also do well on the LPG side. Petrochemicals are different. Yeah, but you know, oil price is like $110. Spot LNG is $180 per barrel of oil equivalent. Coal is extremely expensive. So, you know, if you can't afford LNG, you should be buying LPG because it's much cheaper and it's uh, you don't need all the infrastructure. So, uh, the cert, uh, you know, being worried about demand today, <laughs> you know, it, it's not like on my top 10 list of worries. Of course, there's going to be people buying this. It's cheap. <laughs> Perfect. Then uh, maybe given that kind of market outlook, uh, we have a couple, of maybe 30 seconds each, and and say a bit about uh, what your capital allocation plans are going forward. Uh, I can be quick. Dividends. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we have growth plans on infrastructure, uh, yeah. terminal expansion. So you, you you're pl planning on on becoming a larger integrated player, or is it? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense in the handy size market. Yeah, to to combine the two. Yeah. And Ted, you know. Doran has shown uh, quite a large change uh, over the last few years, uh, especially on the shareholder distribution side. And you have a pretty modern fleet as well. Um, so, so a con continuation is that what can be expected? Yeah, I mean, I think um, since, you know, from a securities law perspective, I'm not going to say anything new here. We've been consistent about paying irregular dividends. Um, so we're not going to, uh, I won't vary from that. But uh, obviously, you can see that our board and our management team are really committed to returning capital to shareholders when it's available and when. Uh, the outlook is favorable, and um, you know we've returned you know four dollars and fifty cents a share in dividends in the last uh, less than a year. So uh, you know continue to you know we'll it obviously rem will remain uh, front and center in management's thinking. Perfect, and uh, I think we're we're running out of time here. So so I'd like to thank the panel and everyone for listening. Thank you, thank you guys.